Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. We're watching Disrupt Investing. Uh, let's start off with Northvolt. The Swedish battery maker has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in the United States on last Thursday. According to Reuters, Northvolt is hoping to come out of this bankruptcy stronger than before. Tom Johnstone, Northvolt's interim chairman of the board, said this decisive step will allow Northvolt to continue its mission to establish a homegrown European industrial base for battery production. Despite near-term challenges, this action to strengthen our capital structure will allow us to capture the continued market demand for vehicle electrification. We are likewise pleased by the strong support we have received from our existing lenders and our customers. So let's be clear. This wasn't a decisive step. That means you get to decide something. It was a necessary step because while Northvolt has $30 million in cash, it also has $5.8 billion, that's billion with a B, in debt and only secured $100 million in financing if the bankruptcy goes the way they want. Northvolt had a net loss of $1.2 billion in 2023. And I think the big takeaway for us investors here is that Europe is not a place to make anything competitively. Sad, but because of the price of electricity and energy, because of unions, and because they are just like a very kind of backwards, afraid of doing anything kind of governmental culture now, these companies can't make it there. I think that this would have been the same of the United States had we not put so many incentives to bringing businesses here. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping now with Doge that we cut government expenses and we become less regulation and stuff. But this is where China has just killed everybody because they don't have all the regulations, good or bad. I'm not getting into that. That means that they can open a factory quicker. They have lots of talented people there who know how to make stuff now. The demand is there, but they can't price stuff to compete with China. So that's why they're going out of business. I, I really do think that manufacturing takes about two generations to get going strong. Mm -hmm. I think that you have the first generation that makes a whole bunch of mistakes and a lot of stuff that you used to buy in China used to be crappy. Not to say that everything coming out of China these days is good, but the amount of technological know-how that they have in China is huge. If you want to learn something, watch some like videos from like the 1950s, especially like tool and die manufacturing. I watched this video. It was really interesting to see like how the tool and die manufacturers of the world are going to create the next steps for humanity. And it was true. I mean, we were leaders in knowing how to produce things at scale. And that was our competitive advantage as a country. And then we just gave it all away, like the next generation after that. Well, and that whole theory you have is about to go away because of Optimus, because basically once one Optimus knows how to do something, they all will. And then forevermore, they'll all know how to do it. So we'll never have to worry again about people having to teach other people. Hmm. It's a kind of mind blowing thing to think about that basically manufacturing can come back to a place and not have to worry about the human base. Mm. So one of the biggest arguments I hear against robo taxis has to do with the model that I think that Tesla is going to follow. Tesla has found a way to jujitsu its way into the robo taxi industry without having to spend its own capital. So instead of the way that Waymo or Cruise does it, where they go out and they buy cars and computers and basically put up all that capital for a fleet of cars, Tesla is going to have us buy the cars ourselves so that we have paid the capital. And then we are going to take our cars and put them onto their network and share the revenue with Tesla. So it's a great model, hardly ever done before, except so many pundits and analysts think that it won't work. They keep repeating the same line I've heard over and over again, which is why would I take my brand new shiny, new smelling Tesla and put it out there to pick up customers who are going to make it smell bad and potentially mess up the interior? And also, how can you explain to your wife when she wants to go to a restaurant that your car is not in the driveway? It's out picking up customers. And I agree. There will be plenty of Tesla owners who will not want to or need to rent out their car. The same argument could be made for Airbnb. Not all of us who own a piece of property are busy renting it out on Airbnb. It's only a tiny fraction of the real estate owning world that lists their properties on Airbnb, say, for rent. And yet Airbnb works. There are enough people who do, in fact, rent out their properties to strangers. So if you go on the Airbnb app today and go to almost any city or place in the world, you will find some properties to rent. So many of these analysts who are probably paid in the six figures think about themselves and they think about whether they would rent out their Tesla. And I get it. Most of them wouldn't. But. What they're forgetting is that the same could have been said about Uber. How many people who own a car would like to drive their car around and pick up strangers and risk their lives and risk being robbed and risk having people throw up in the back seat? Well, it turns out quite a few. In fact, there are currently about six million active Uber drivers worldwide. The other aspect that a lot of these analysts are not thinking about is what will happen when robo taxis do become a thing. There will be enterprising people out there who will buy cars from Tesla solely to put them on the robo taxi network. If you can 
lease a Tesla for 200 bucks a month and then put it on the network and earn much more than that, you'll just keep buying Teslas and putting them on the network. Now, obviously, there are places in the world where the density of Teslas are higher in towns like Austin, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And it's likely that those are the places that Tesla will start in, because one of the most important factors in making a robo taxi network work is always having enough supply of transportation available to meet the needs of your customers. Because the day that you go on the Uber app or the Tesla app to get a car and there aren't any that respond to you is the day that you switch to a different network. And I just want to talk again about Airbnb. It doesn't take much to start this revolution. Airbnb was a revolution. Now, you may never have used it. And so you might be like, I don't know what you're talking about. But if you ask around at work, you'll probably find a lot of people use it. And a lot of people don't go back to hotels because it is a cheaper some would say better experience. Now, when we're talking about Airbnb, it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about houses. Most people need to live in a house like pretty consistently, right? So it is pretty disruptive to like put your house on Airbnb and then somebody rents it out and you kind of have to like leave. Either that or you have to own a house that you're not using a majority of the time, which is really weird. Plus a house has things like bed sheets and dishes and all sorts of other things. It's a lot of stuff to keep up with and work with. With a car, the car has basically been designed to drive people around. The problem has been that unless there's somebody in there driving it, you're not driving anybody around. And with the car, you don't need it all the time and it can move. So it's very convenient for you, the owner of the car, the robo taxi, to be able to say, go out, come back at this time. I mean, if you had a friend who was gonna go Uber your car for you and you said, just be sure to come back by five to pick me up from work, okay, so then that would be how you would do it. It's the utilization rate of cars, which is so stupid. They're very useful for short trips. People don't need to stay in them for three days at a time to go to the beach and to go visit some lovely city. They just need to get from one place to another and then that car can go somewhere else. That is the difference between robo taxis and Airbnb and yet Airbnb still works. I predict there will be lots of mini fleets. I mean, if you think about it right now, an Uber driver is tied up all day driving the Uber. They cannot take care of any more cars than their own. Mm -hmm. But if that Uber driver is no longer a driver and that Uber driver is a cyber cab fleet owner, mm -hmm. let's say 20 cars as they come in and some need to be clean, some need a new tire, some need to have the windshields washed or whatever. That's something that that driver who was busy for eight hours could now be doing for eight hours instead. And instead of one car making him money, he now has 20. We've seen a lot of cyber trucks on our community mail time that have wraps. Mm -hmm. And I've seen plenty of cyber trucks that have wraps around us. And people are paying to put the wraps on the cyber trucks that and not just fancy wraps. I'm talking about wraps that advertise a business. Mm -hmm. OK, so someone is willing to basically put up with driving a cyber truck and needing to cover that thing with advertising in order to help make that payment. Now you could not have to advertise and just while you're not using the car, which is very frequently, just put it out on the network. I think that people are going to be willing to do that. I think that right now when somebody is just suggesting the idea of you putting your car on the network to other people, you're just thinking about like, oh, ew gross. I don't see any benefit. And it's like, right, because I'm not telling you how much you're going to be making, how much of that car payment is going to go away. People get really, really stupid about this thing because they they let their disgust of like, ew, strangers in my car completely cloud their judgment over dollars and cents. Well, and also it may not be for you, but there's plenty of enterprising people out there who drive cabs or Ubers today who this is what they do. And the other factor we're not talking about is that cyber cabs are going to cost about $25,000. So instead of having to make a $100,000 purchase like for a cyber truck today, mm -hmm. a cyber cab is $25,000. It'll start paying it for itself probably within a year and a half. And so as that money starts coming in, you add a second one to your network and a third. And unlike cars today, ICE cars that require a lot of maintenance and a lot of expensive fuel, these are going to be a lot less expensive to operate. So there's so many things here that are going to just change transportation. And for you, the user, let's say you don't want to own a cyber cab. For you, the user, the price of transportation per mile is going to drop, which means that a whole bunch of other things are going to happen. And again, this is why we're on disruptive investing here, because as this disrupts all sorts of things we can barely think about. You, the investor, have to be thinking about ahead of time what's going to happen. And I'll leave you with this. There's a scene in the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles where Steve Martin and John Candy are getting into an airport. It's snowing out and they've been, you know, their flight has been changed from Chicago to wherever it was. And John Candy is the first person to get to a phone and call for a hotel. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Meanwhile, when the announcement finally comes out that their flight's been you know, delayed to the next day, everyone rushes to a phone to find a hotel. That's you right now.
it's except for there's no phone. There's you thinking about what is going to be happening very soon when this happens. If you can get out in front of it and start investing in companies that no one's thinking about right now, your returns are going to be a whole lot higher than theirs. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. We'll see you guys next week on Disruptive Investing.